don't care. Welcome to the griefer world. Pundits have declared that it's internet trolling in the real world. No, it's online game griefing, breaking things because you can, even or especially if it reduces the enjoyment of others. If I, uh, and then I was asked, um, was this was this predicted by folks like Al, Alvin Toffler? Mm -hmm. if, I, in my, if I recall correctly, much of the futurist work of the 1960s and 1970s was predicated on the continued presence and power of the USSR. That truly distorted things, even when other aspects are prescient. You know, so Bruce and I gave it as an example, Bruce Sterling's Islands in the Net. Then I said, uh, uh, it's no insight to say that we live in a world run by people who exploit weaknesses in the system. Not a new problem. But I don't think we've ever seen so many people with so much power who are so willing to completely deny reality if doing so suits their goals. Again, the scale. It has obvious impacts on climate. Take a look at the Australian government unwillingness to connect climate and massive fucking wildfires. But given that it's reality, it affects everything. And it's like living in the Monty Python argument sketch. Did you ask for the five minute argument? <laughs> we'll start with the five minute and see if we want to go to the eight. No, no, no. This is the three, the three minute argument. You can't be here. Yeah, yeah. No, I didn't. But it's that, yeah, so the proper response to it, it's like the argument, the um, Monty Python argument sketch to say, no, it isn't. Right. But, Right. But so I, that has gotten a lot of a lot of retweets and likes and you know, I'm not in the influencer st level, but it was um, it was gratifying to see that that seemed to connect for a lot of people. Um, yeah, and I just uh, a bunch of people have joined us since you started talking. I turned the yep. recorder on. So we are now recording the Rex uh, check in call for December of 2019. I have a couple of poems I'd like to start us out with, but this is a great, uh, a great sequence of, uh, of thoughts you threw in. Um, and April says, hi, she's, a, she's listening on the call. She's actually got to be on a different call at the same time. So she's going to tag team, but uh, uh, there we go. And uh, let me hit pause for just a second. Uh, say hi to everybody and uh, read two poems for us. Hi, everybody. Um, the first one is, uh, and these are both poems I've read before in Rex, but you know what? Uh, good things deserve, uh, deserve a refresh. So this one, first one is uh, by Billy Collins titled on turning 10, cause I just passed a little birthday and, uh, this, this is sort of the feeling of it. So on turning 10 by Billy Collins, the whole idea of it makes me feel like I'm coming down with something, something worse than any stomach ache or the headaches I get from reading in bad light, a kind of measles of the spirit, a mumps of the psyche, a disfiguring chicken pox of the soul. You tell me it's too early to be looking back, but that's because you have forgotten the perfect simplicity of being one and the beautiful complexity introduced by two. But I can lie on my bed and remember every digit. At four, I was an Arabian wizard I could make myself invisible by drinking a glass of milk a certain way. At seven, I was a soldier. At nine, a prince. But now I am mostly at the window watching the late afternoon light. Back then, it never fell so solemnly against the side of my tree house. And my bicycle never leaned against the garage as it does today. All the dark blue speed drained out of it. This is the beginning of sadness, I say to myself, as I walk through the universe in my sneakers, it is time to say goodbye to my imaginary friends, time to turn the first big number. It seems only yesterday I used to believe there was nothing under my skin but light. If you cut me, I could shine. But now when I fall upon the sidewalks of life, I skin my knees, I bleed. And the second poem is, is really quite different, although it's similar. Uh, it's titled How to Listen by Major Jackson. And I'll put the link in our chat. And it's a bit shorter. How to Listen by Major Jackson. I'm going to cock my head tonight like a dog in front of McGlinchey's Tavern on Locust. I'm going to stand beside the man who works all day combing his thatch of gray hair corkscrewed in every direction. I'm going to pay attention to our lives unraveling between the forks of his fine tooth comb. For once, 
we won't talk about the end of the world or Vietnam or his exquisite paper shoes. For once, I'm going to ignore the profanity and the dancing and the jukebox so I can hear his head crackle beneath the sky's stretch of faint stars. We are, I, I sent somebody an, an email yesterday in which I wrote something about 2020 as if it were an actual year and an actual date. And I think it was the first time I had sort of written anything where 2020 was intentionally like the year we're about to be in. Mm -hmm. And it was really weird. It just felt strange. I was like, well, okay, I, you know, 2020 is not a date I expected to run across really soon. Similar to 2000 in that regard. I remember having a similar kind of reaction. 1984. 2000. Wait a minute. This was a book title, <clears throat> right? At 2001, Space Odyssey. But we, where's, where's, my, where's my jet, where's my space travel? Plus, we just passed the, uh, uh, what was it, November 1st, 2019, Blade Runner? Or yep, the Blade Runner date, right? And there's the Back to the Future date? Yeah, Blade Runner is now alternate history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Has anybody else been having a, a little reaction to 2020 coming? Somebody told me that a trip at the end of January is coming up in six weeks. And I was like, I don't think that's true because that's next year. So that's got to be pretty far away. So far. So far. <laughs> I've just been generally puzzled by, I mean, it's like a new thing for me to be experiencing, but the, uh, just the elasticity of time and not being able to know how long ago something was, or, you know, it seems like it was a long, long time ago, but it was three years. And it's been, I've, I've only in the last couple of months started going back to like my Facebook memories list, you know? Oh, wow. Which I'd never found before. And so I've been looking at that and I'm going, whoa, that was like only eight years or, you know, and so anyway, it's a, it, I think it's exacerbated by that memories thing, but. Wanna have yeah. some fun? Um, give, ac give accurate dates to your old photos when you post them on Facebook because you'll get a memory. Here's your memory from 1943 or, you know. That's a great idea. No, no, I've not heard that. Uh, Google Photos does a really good job of, you know, here's the same day of five, five years ago, whatever. It, it also does a bunch of automatic lookbacks that, uh, that are pretty good. You know, re relive this day in uh, five years ago or 10 years ago, if you've been well, playing in there for long enough. Some of these things are like things that, I mean, I guess, you, you were pre, my, I met you pre-Facebook, but, but something like a whole bunch of the folks that I know out in the Bay Area, I met because of a Forum One event in 2008. And mm -hmm. so the memory popped up, you know, kind of last, in the last couple of weeks. And it's fascinating because like all of these threads connect back to this one unconference that, you know, that uh, Bill Johnston hosted. Uh, and it's, it's kind of amazing to think back of what, you know, what that one little event did. How it clicks with together so many different people. Yeah. yeah. And then, Jamey, let me go back to, um, just for a second, to what you were talking about and to your tweet stream, uh, because uh, back in the day, I noted the reality-based community comment by Karl Rove, and I have it connected to the post-factual world and a bunch of other articles. Mm -hmm. uh, retreat from empiricism on Ross, uh, Ron Suskin's scoop, How America Lost Its Mind, cover story of the Atlantic, uh, The Trouble with Reality, uh, rumination on moral panic in our time, and all, and, and also the, the general thought of the post-factual world, mm -hmm. which is, which is you know about post-truth, post-factual, all that. And and I think that Rove was giving us a nice uh, look into the coming the coming seasons. Yeah, exactly. And we didn't pay close enough attention at the time. Not at you all. Know, that that's the you know, and frankly, that's my job, and I didn't do my job right. My job is to take a look at these things and think through the larger scale implications, the ones that are not, not obvious, but are, are potentially, potentially powerful. And um, what does pink mean, by the way? Um, that purpley kind of color, I use yellow and that purpley color to call things out. And the yellow tends to be uh, non-opinionated things. So uh, whenever I get a crowded thought, I, I always start articles about that topic. So, you know, articles about truth should be right under truth. So that's yellow. Uh, but the purpley color is more uh, fake news. How long will the post-factual world go? The death march. I don't know why my brain is acting so slow right now. So, so here's yellow. Articles about facts, articles about, uh, articles about fake news, types of stuff uh, would be in yellow. 
but then the purple and and to me the yellow and the purple are just to draw your eye toward things that right. that run deep so so it just means hey there's a lot more here right so this is your personal recommendation algorithm yeah exactly a colorful personal recommendation algorithm or cfable <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, how do we how do we react against post truth? Post truth. What should journalists do in the post factual world? Uh, how do we keep Trump from? Uh, wow, my brain is really slow. I think I have way too many things running. Um, anyway, let me stop sharing and see if I can't reboot the brain and stuff like that. Uh, and Dave just shared an Ezra Klein interview with uh, Andrew Morantz. Yeah, I know. I just caught the last last of what you were saying, uh, Amy. I mean that. Uh... The uh, this the interview I thought was really excellent, and it was he, Morantz, I guess, kind of embedded himself with some trolls, and so he was kind of studying the troll behavior, and and I thought that the uh, the the stuff around uh, you know again some of the utopianism we had around the online community summits back you know 10, 12, 14 years ago, and how all this stuff is just democracy and it's going to be wonderful, and you know kind of what's the implications of that, what are the responsibilities for it and stuff, or they just had a really excellent conversation I thought about those things. Mm -hmm. One of the better interviews I've heard in a while. And it's interesting, in the days when <clears throat> people with good intention were showing up on the net and we just connected to one another through open forums and open media, and there wasn't this underlying model of addicting us and selling us off, um, I think it was easy to think that, hey, this is going to be good. If this spreads to everybody, um, we, this might actually go good places. And then, and then the winners of the game of Connect All wound up being the addictive platforms, et cetera, et cetera. And then we end up uh, in, you know, tangled in our underwear here. Well, and the, and the you know, the fact that the, the algorithm that makes them be the winner is the one that makes us mad at each other mm -hmm. is fascinating, right? So. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you ordered the five minute argument, Jermaine. Did I get it out your nose, Kelly? Oh, came, okay, that was the goal. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody played with the new platforms, like with, with Jimbo's new platform or the MeWe thing, or anybody trying these things out? I'm getting a lot of MeWe requests. I think I, I think I went on it and then decided not to do it. So I think I've got a profile in there, and people keep saying, you know, ping me, ping me, whatever. And I'm, I'm resisting yet another social media platform. So not that. And then the Tribune, the Wiki Tribune thing, I'm not trying. I, it's like, I until I see some good until. Until things posted in Wiki Tribune show up in my natural, in my organic feed, meaning they've done good enough work that it gets referred forward, that I see it showing up, I won't pay much attention to that either. I guess the one thing that struck me, and it was from the Klein interview, was they were talking about how, uh, you know, this, this idea of or, how, how it shows up organically is one of the kind of fallacies, perhaps, because the trolls are actually doing a very deliberate uh, you know, multi-person kind of effort to make things uh, viral. And mm -hmm. so when they make things trending, then it, they, then it tips into real news. But it was a deliberate effort by a small group of people to make something trend. And I was wondering, well, geez, could we do that? You know, could a small group of us decide that we were going to focus in maybe in a new platform and kind of deliberately, like in the morning, get together and say, all right, this is the idea we were going to, we're going to promote this week or this today and see if we could do a troll strategy. Um, which, is, which is what the other side is doing. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Uh, no, I was just thinking of Greta Thunberg being Time's Person of the Year, that that's a kind of symbolic attractor for such a movement. We'll see. Um, part of what makes, um, and I, I call these things denial of discourse attacks, um, and part of what makes them work is the coordination or the synchronization that you just described, Dave. It's, it's you know, lots of people say, all right, good, we're going to, and, and the Republican strategy post Gingrich in 94 was to pass around talking points and to punish anyone who deviated from the talking points. Hey, Bill, good to see you. Hello. Sorry I'm late. It's all right. Somebody needs to go back in time and strangle Frank Luntz to the crib. Ah, uh, good point. Hey, Jerry, can I, can I take us back to uh, the fifth century BC to the Peloponnesian War for a little bit? Well, okay, okay, I think that's good. Let me dial Zoom in to the Peloponnesian <laughs> War. I've been, I've been just waiting for you to bring this up, so I'm really <laughs> glad you did. <laughs> okay, I just want to read a little. Um, Aristophanes and the, the, the post-truth world is all, was known as Sophism in 5th century BC. Oh, we're going back here. Okay, good. So first I want to 
to write to read something that'll give us a little humorous bent on our current. Day. Okay, uh, I, I just woke up, so I, I'll try to say this right. Demosthenes, according to the oracle, you must become the greatest of men, sausage seller. Just tell me how a sausage seller can become a great man, Demosthenes. That is precisely what, why you will be great, because you are a sad rascal without shame, no better than a common market rogue, spoilt child of fortune. Everything fits together to ensure your greatness. <coughs> but I have not had the least education. I can only read, and that very badly, Demosthenes. That is what makes you, that is what may stand in your way, almost knowing how to read. So <laughs> our, there is our president. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, just another little paragraph. Go, go, go. Okay. <coughs> This, uh, so this is about talking about sophism. And this the, is be uh, better than a poetry slam. Go ahead. So this is um, uh, okay. This is um, about you know the end of the end of the Peloponnesian War when the when what was going on with the Greeks and sophism. All that was all this was now lost in the partisan dissension the Peloponnesian War had engendered. The old ideal which conservatives <laughs> still admired, the old ideal which conservatives like Aristophanes still admired of a life of simple piety of respect for the law and religion and custom, and a patriotic, patriotic de devotion to one's city as the completion and fulfillment of one's own life had largely lost its force. The new type of man developing under the pressures of war was a cynic who believed that might was right, who rejected all the old loyalties and all the old virtues unless they were expedient. That is, unless they helped him accomplish his private ends. He was, in fact, the type of Athenian representative whose negotiations with, okay, so, and then just one other little thing. Um, and this is a quote from that time, or this is a, a dialogue. You who pretend to be engaged in the pursuit of truth are appealing now to the popular and vulgar notions of right, which are admirable by convention, not by nature. Conventions and nature are generally at variance with one another. The reasons, as I conceive, is that, that makers of law are the majority who are weak and they make laws and distribute praises and censures with a view to themselves, to their own interests, blah, blah, blah. So post-truth, Peloponnesian War. Done. I'm dropping the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I didn't read too fast, but it's, uh, oh, okay, I'm done. <laughs> that was great, that was great. Are somebody, are, are, is somebody waiting to jump in? I can't tell. But uh, just to add a little more to it, this is what Plato and, both Plato and Aristotle were responding to, the, the overwhelming cynicism in the post-truth world. So that is why Plato, for example, invented the um, theory of forms. He wanted to get truth back. So for you, this, and this, uh, this, this lights up again our conversation that just began on one of our calls about sophistry. Um, that we need to turn into an inside Jerry's brain call separate, I think, from this, but it, you know, we, we can roll the ball a bit here, but I'm really interested because, and this, this goes back to Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where uh, Pierzig is basically looking back on uh, the Phaedrus, uh, at one of uh, Plato's books, and um, basically talking about sophists. Um, for me, the big question coming out of Zen and the Outer Motorcycle Maintenance was, were the sophists actually bad or were they good? And like, so, so when I look back, I'm like, wow, we, we picked like the wrong team won and we built the entire edifice of Western civilization on purely logical constructs, ignoring the connectedness, the social, the whatever. And you know, when I give speeches, I say, <laughs> we, in, we instructed the designers of all of our <laughs> to ignore the woo-woo stuff. Like forget about the soft, the, the soft skills, the community <coughs> connection, you know, all that kind of stuff doesn't really matter. Well, another movement happened um, called the Stoa after Aristotle and Plato in the, in the, <coughs> the fall of the Roman Empire, which was basically a repeat of the post-truth world. So, there was two movements. so Plato and Aristotle did not really hold sway. Mm -hmm. Their sway lasted for several hundred years, but yet again, society fell apart and truth had to go and power had to come back. <laughs> There's two movements we'll have to address, not just uh, not just the, the sophists. Exactly, and anybody who'd like to complete that set, um, jump on in, because I, I am no classicist, no expert on these things. I'm just sort of this this was my reaction from reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, 
and I've always wanted to dig deeper in and I've never quite known, you know, where to, where to point the, the, the flashlight. Um, but like what, I, what I really like, what, what I really like, but what's really clear to me is like this, the, the Peloponnesian War, you know, tore Greece apart, just tore them apart. And all of a sudden, they <coughs> found themselves like killing fellow Greeks and enslaving them when supposedly before that they were, you know, good guys. And, and, and you know, it caused desperation and a dissolve in, the, in society, you know, society wide and people not having a stake in the way things run and power struggles. And that's what we're having right now. In and my in, and ancient, the sort of the first half of it, as my amateur understanding is that the first half of ancient Greece is actually a, a, about democracy and about discourse and about a whole lot of interesting things. And then it basically falls apart. And the rest of, the rest of ancient Greece is about Greece just falling apart until, it's, until it falls. Until Rome takes over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So yeah, um, I really want Jamey's like input now, man. Come on, Jamey, I threw it in. You're the future. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your article on that, Jimmy? Come on. I am worthless. I apologize. <laughs> um, well, I'm wondering who among our communities is like is like deeply, uh, you know, schooled in in these kinds of things because because I, I think this is you know we're we're, we're fighting <coughs> we're fighting ancient battles over and over again, right? Yes. We continue to do that. Bill, yeah. do you want to jump in? Yeah, well, yeah. I would just I would just sort of bring this forward a little bit. There was there was a book written called Parable of the Tribes. Uh -huh. um, let me try and find this guy's name. Andrew Bard Schmuckler is a real sort of academic one, but basically what he was doing was translating Darwinism into sort of like a cultural sense of you know what, what what how did we get sidetracked in other words the whole concept of darwinism or, or social darwinism was that there was this you know in essence fitness was the determination as to whether or not you were going to succeed. And in essence, what Schmuckler was getting into is the fact that that shifted with the whole agri agricultural shift to power being the determinant. In other words, whether or not <clears throat> you were fit was irrelevant. Mm -hmm. If you were powerful, then you were in charge and you got to make the rules, whether or not everybody else understood that or not. And it was interesting that I was, I was reading an article about the beginning of the process of, you know, of, of Nazism and, and uh, fascism in Italy, and how Mussolini and Hitler literally were recruited by institutional sources. I be, you know, in other words, the big German and Italian corporations, they basically got together, sort of what, what I would consider a Trump, you know, uh, cabinet, of industrialists that just say, I'm going to tear the system apart for my benefit. Now, in Germany and Italy, that was behind the scenes. In other words, they, they, that wasn't something that was visible in a cabinet level or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just seeing it more blatant now because of the fact that, in essence, the, the nature of, of fascism, I mean, when, when you tear away the, what I would call the, the sort of you know, vernacular of fascism being just bad. Fascism really is just corporate control of the business, of the, of the government. So are you seeing, Bill, where I've just took, taken my brain to fascism is good for business? Right. It, uh, in, in, in essence, fascism is business in control of the economy. Right. Without regard to any kind of social aspects. In other words, they, before Hitler, before Nazi, uh, Germany was one of the most dramatic examples of social clauses, social support. It was, it was a, a perfect example of how things could be done. Um, and to the extent that that was sort of like going over into Italy, you know, where the whole idea that their, their trains work perfectly. In other words, they, they had examples of how government could work well. Mm -hmm. All of that was privatized and, and torn apart and essentially demonized. In other words, that's, that's helping 
immigrants, that's helping Jews, that's helping, you know, people who are against us. In other words, they, they used all of the language that Trump uses in order to establish a ground for the value of being fascist. Or so one thing I'm finding, control. sorry, sorry, go on. So, but, but his whole point was that we've got to realize that we're selecting for power, not fitness. In other words, all of the, 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 if you read the books on, you know, why we're cooperative and all this kind of stuff, it's really about the nature of human nature in wanting to cooperate in tribes and this, that, and the other thing. But that doesn't work if the overriding system is selecting for power, not social responsibility, not Bill, cooperation. Bill, man, you hit, you're hitting the ball out of the park, but Jamey said something, so I want to let Jamey go in. Jamey? Oh, I was just going to uh, note that it's um, interesting, and I wonder how it fits with, with what you've been talking about, Bill, that uh, while Trump's initial cabinet posts were very much in the, uh, in the realm of business <coughs> leaders or, uh, or uh, institutional leaders who want to basically break, break things down for the benefit of industry, right. um, many of those people are out and replaced by people who are obsequious mm -hmm. people who their goal yeah they may break up things for industry or damage things for industry but that's almost secondary to appeasing appeasing the leader okay, and the leader just wants to basically grab control for the benefit of business no he or wants to grab control for the benefit of him yeah even the obsequious ones are firmly committed to business I, know, I think that you can, yeah. it's not top down, it's bottom up. I mean, it's like if you bring in enough incompetence, competent people don't want to be there, right? So <laughs> the people who actually know how to run the White House don't want to be there. Right. Yeah. right. So you've got really incompetent people coming in. And it's, it's, it's not like a master plan of, I mean, there may be, I don't, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't think, I mean, whoever killed Epstein may have a plan. I don't know. But but these, the people, you know, the, the what's happening now is just a dynamic, I think, that, that leads to a low level of uh, outcome. I have a way to tie Bill's point in really well. Bill, wow, thanks. All right. So here's how this all works out power is exactly what results. So if you make truth, you introduce relativism, which the Sophists did, which the Stoists did, which is there's no truth, everything's relative, it's all your point of view. Do you know what's left? The who has the power to make their point of view the truth. And that's what the Sophists believe, and that's what the Stoa believe. And if you really think about it, and there's no truth, and everything's relative, and it's just whatever narrative you want to make up, then all that's left is who has the power to control the narrative. So, Bill, okay, bam. You, 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 want to, you want to shift to a, a sort of maybe a five or a thousand year plan? I was I was watching a an interpretation of this exact you know issue from a Taoist point of view. In other words, that that basically the Tao says that you're supposed to respect the true nature of things. In other words, true nature is not made; it is, and you have to respect what is, and that the fundamental driver of that is trust. And clearly, trust is completely devoid in a system that's run by power because they don't trust anybody else. And just as an aside, I mean, one of, the, one of my studies is something called human design developed by a guy out of Spain, but he passed away in 2009 or 10. Um, but his prediction, human design is basically a nine chakra sense establishment of where humanity is moving from a consciousness point of view. And where we've been, according to his analysis, is what he calls a system of killer monkeys. And in essence, systems have been structured in such a way that it manages killer monkeys for the benefit of the 1%. That's a whole power issue. And he says that institutions have been structured intentionally to manage the masses. In other words, to manage <laughs> the whole process so that it keeps us dumbed down, keeps us not communicating, Scare. not supporting things, not Scare. getting our way 90% of the time, 1% gets theirs 90% of the time. 
And his point was that basically he was predicting before he passed away that somewhere around 2025, 2027, there was going to be a complete breakdown of institutions so that things like the Dow and things like self-organizing systems will begin to substitute for the institutions which are completely failing, completely not serving anybody other than the 1%. And in essence, even the 1% doesn't feel that it's doing it efficiently anymore. So they want to break it down even more, which is going to propel the process even faster, which is good. In other words, the, the basic thing of the Dow is you should also always trust where you are as being the perfect place. In other words, it's the means by which you get to the next level, whether it's of consciousness or whatever. And I'm, I'm doing studies and everything. There's a woman, Patricia Albera, who's into we consciousness, we evolution, um, collective consciousness. In other words, basically coming up with ways to actually articulate, in other words, create connections, universal worldwide connections between people where you're communicating from your soul level, not your, your, your ego level. I mean, the, the beauty of this thing, and I'll try and find it and, and, and post it and everything, of uh, the, the work on the Tao is they say that you know, the, the whole idea of anarchy is not effective because all you're doing is sub substituting a new agenda. In other words, you're right, they're wrong, as opposed to the trust that's inherent in the Taoism, which if you start to build trust, which is what we're trying to do in our Center for Social Change, in other words, organize things in such a way that you trust everybody. And if they screw up, figure out why they screwed up. They didn't probably do it intentionally. They just screwed up but trust them again. And if it screws up again, trust them again. In other words, so that you're building trust as the fundamental guiding aspect, not some kind of logical, organized, institutional, conceptual you know, thing that ultimately is gonna fail because somebody else is gonna argue with you and all of a sudden now it's fake news that you're right and they're wrong. You know, Bill, it's a, but Bill, I wanna live in a world of killer monkeys because I'm a big killer monkey. <laughs> So you were uh, saying by selection by power, you're that okay a, with that. That was a joke. I just love the idea. I just love the killer monkey thing. But I, I want to also address something, your, your Darwinism thing. There were, Darwin's theories are completely in, in pre-Socratic philosophers. It's all there. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of people don't realize is that, oh, I'm sure as, I'm, as soon as I say it, everyone else is going to go, oh, yeah. There's this teleology and metaphysics to Darwinism that gets over applied and can justify the cruelest of cruelties. And right. we can clearly do it. So I'm really glad you identified that because that's the other poison. There's no truth, there's only power. And then you pull in Darwinism with this teleology and stuff that, it, that people give to it. They give it all this power that it doesn't have. All this, right. and they interpret that theory in all kinds of ways it should not be interpreted. And the interpretation essentially becomes he who has the most power wins and right. deserves to win. Yep. Okay. So well, if you're going back to the 500 year plan, you really have to invest your, your process in trust. And then Jerry and I have been talking to him while I've, I've sent him some articles where essentially I think that our institutional structure and our whole, all our society needs a renegotiation right now. Um, we, are, we are actively in the middle of such a thing. Susan, did you want to jump in? Um, I just wanted to, um, I've been re reading, uh, hmm, oh gosh, Darwin's Finches. Mm. The uh, a book that came out in the what late eighties maybe, um, which which is the people who went on to study the finches after Darwin left, mm -hmm. and to study them, um, uh, quite in quite detailed in quite detailed fashion as Are as he did, and and um, they as climate change is moving in. Uh, they they are observing the the rapid evolution of uh, of the uh, finches, of species. Yes. By the way, Darwin's finches, nineteen forty seven. Yeah. Well, there's another one. Oh, it's, okay. It's, uh, I will find it. Well, actually, I'll find it right now. We can all look. There's the beak of the finch and a different book. <clears throat> I just uploaded that video on um, the Dow and trust issue. Yeah. 
cool. So this uh, is this is the beak of the finch. Is that the book, the beak of the finch? Sorry, the beak I, of the finch is the one that I'm talking about. Oh, good. So that's what I was <laughs> and, just showing. It's a yeah. totally different book. Yes. What year is it published? I think eighty. Uh, the uh, ninety four. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, ninety four. So anyway, the point is. Um, that, that it's a, there's an interesting uh, an interesting discussion in here about the when the context changes what happens and that change um, species can actually adapt quite quickly um, to to the situation I mean they you know and if the situation changes again they may die but <laughs> mm -hmm. you know I don't know where the the power argument comes in there, but um, I just thought it was worth pointing out that this work continues and the inter and the, uh, you know, people do go back and interpret <laughs> the original, the original uh, Darwinism in, well, they do, they do kind of crazy things with it. That's all. But we, we do that all the time as people. I was thinking that um, one of the things that I want, the question I really wanted to ask was, but don't all these power things apply to neoliberalism as well? For sure. <laughs> and, that and, kind of... and those dynamics, those social dynamics aren't, aren't any different. <laughs> or not, they don't change just because the, the uh, narrative changes. But Susan, what, what are you uh, trying to get at there? I mean, have you ever read uh, Naomi Klein's book, Shock Doctrine? In other words, that's exactly, in other words, they basically determined that in order to actually get neoliberalism tested, in other words, and basically Chile was the first place they were going to do it, that the University of Chicago spent nine months preparing for the CIA to go in there and kill Allende, you know, and, and basically they, they had a complete, they wanted it to be a prototype to prove that neoliberalism worked if you're allowed to basically kill everybody that's got a social conscious and insist on dynamic control of the economy solely for the benefit of the rich. And that's exactly what they did. And they ended up basically, quote, proving that it worked in Chile and then pr proceeded to go to Bolivia and Argentina and <clears throat> continued to sort of like roll through Latin America in order to prove that the shock was necessary in order to get the the kind of of shift to, to real neoliberalism rather than this coddling type of you know semi level of social support you know when there should be none no it's not the rich it's the stockholder bill don't you understand we got to manage for the benefit of the stockholder dude the, the problem with even referring to stockholders is that, that mm -hmm. you're, 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 not, you're not dealing with the one-tenth of one percent that are really sort of pulling the strings and paying for all of this stuff in the background. You know, I mean, how does Mitch McConnell become worth $24 million in the space of 10 years <clears throat> on a salary of $250,000 a year? You know, I mean... Well, he marries well, right? That's well, right. He did. But they're both right. basically just psychophants that are just. But Bill, I gotta there. say, I, I, the, the Naomi Klein version that you just, I haven't read any of her stuff. And so I, I'll put that out there. But I, it sounds like a conspiracy theory that I don't buy, right? I, I think it implies a whole lot of confidence and too large a group. And I just can't, my worldview doesn't allow for that yeah. kind of a deliberate intervention at that scale, right, with that much evil, kind of. I mean, I, I just don't get it. I don't believe it. So I, I wouldn't know how to verify do, it. Do me a favor and at least, at least try and get a, a summary of it or a YouTube summary of her description of it, because it is, it is so detailed and so thorough in terms of how they did that. <clears throat> there literally was a point about conspiracies book. also, which I think Gore Vidal expressed really well. When people were, and, and this was like back in the old days, when people were worried about the Eastern uh, you know, Easterners running the country and so on. And he basically said, well, they all uh, go to the same prep schools, they go to the same <clears throat> colleges, they hang out, they don't need to conspire. They already all think alike. And, and I think that's basically how shock doctrine uh, works is that, uh, you know, it's, it's like emergent behavior essentially. And by the way, just as a really important footnote, let's not forget that Russia was also 
part of the whole shock doctrine thing, and it's come back to bite us essentially. Okay, but but Mark, Mark, let, let me just sort of footnote that because one of the leaders, I can't remember the name of the guy, that, that the whole sort of like good side of shock doctrine was totally, totally, totally depressed by the way that the U.S. handled Russia, because in essence, every other place, even Chile, even you know Bolivia, etc., they always had a World Bank support system that was going along with it. In other words, there was going to be some dampening of the, of the impact on this, the, the existing social system. Apparently when they applied it in Russia, literally all of those sources backed off and said, screw them, they've got to do it the hard way. And that's why they ended up with the oligarchs, that's why they ended up with the killings, that's why they ended up with the, the whole KGB really running the entire government. Uh, all I'm saying is that, that <clears throat> the way that they did Russia and it's in the book, the Shock Doctrine book. The way they did Russia, it, it was exactly the opposite of the way that they did the arrest because they wanted to punish Russia for not being cooperative enough. But, but also Russia was complicated by an explicit conspiracy, which is basically Clinton's support for Yeltsin. Uh, okay, but that's part of the point. It, it was supposed to support it in a socially value valued way in other words that was the way that they did the rest of the shock doctors but they didn't do it they withdrew it right what well, i'm saying what, what clinton did was basically he 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 basically almost guaranteed yeltsin's election which validated this whole corruption that uh, you know i mean Yel yeltsin I, well you know i don't want to go into details here but i think it's a combination of kind of immersion behavior of people who just behave according to the way they're brought up and so on. And then there's explicit conspiracies as well. I don't doubt that for a second. Right. I think Kelly had a comment or question. Well, only that I would, I'm interested to go back to kind of Susan's point, which is um, because I think it ties into something that we're working on and we we're just working <coughs> on last week at, in my world, which is sort of related to this story of like, if you were a housewife in the 1950s and you had the mind of a nuclear physicist, what you did with that was you had very complicated systems in your kitchen about what Tupperware you could use where and what could go, you know, like you, like, we as humans build systems, I think for our own selves designed to keep ourselves entertained. And so, and so how do we build, we will, I think always want to move in tribes <laughs> And we will always want to have in groups and out groups, and we will always want to have rivalries. And this is where we were talking about this last week. We've built these incredibly unhelpful silos in our organizations that are that are these um, destructive rivalries when we're supposedly working toward the same end. And so, can we? What can we build um, as a structure that allows us to still move in those sort of ways, but in a much more constructive, with a much more constructive output, right? So, can we build these sort of systems? In, from my perspective, just where I'm sitting now in, a, in our organizations that have this kind of like these team-based rivalries that have actually excellent and constructive outputs. Um, so what they think so is- Fruitful rivalries of some sort. Of some kind, yeah. Set, setting up intentional rivalries with a, with a beneficial outcome. Right, or is rivalries the wrong word? Or mm -hmm. right, how do we build in-groups and out-groups that are actually con <coughs> constructive? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But well, often, uh, you know, let, let me try again. <laughs> let me try again. I've been trying to explain this for years. Um, so the importance, um, Bill, of, of the noticing, uh, to, to, to go to Kelly's point that she was just making, is that the dynamics of, um, I mean, I come from a world of this whole business of, for instance, the cent one central idea being communities of practice, which are, which are a social dynamic. They are an emergent phenomenon. They can be also formalized and authorized, uh, but, but they, they are the way things work. And the inside and the outside is, is kind of inevitable, right? So that would, one would think that, that simply recognizing <laughs> that this is what's going on um, would give us some, some amount of understanding and uh, new kinds of um, intervention. It operates on a very small scale. I mean, you know, it, it's in the, in the practice of, of, you know, Trump's White House, the, practice, the practices that have evolved there, 
are recognizable to us from the outside, but it's very structurally, um, I mean, socially, socially bound, right? It's, it's as tight as a gang. And, and those, and those things are quite, quite small, but they keep happening and they are the same things. You know, whenever you get a new, whenever you get a new, uh, journal in an academic field, you know, behind it is a community of practice. <laughs> it's not just one individual. It's a whole way of seeing the world. It's a whole way of, of doing these things. And we go in and out. I, I mean, we're having all this trouble with different, um, with all this identity stuff and, and inclusive, inclusivity. And I listened to a conversation yesterday about all these different things. And the only way we seem to have is to open up and, and, and include everyone and every identity and every everything, rather than understanding that we all go in and out of identities all day long. Um, that we participate in different ways. And I, I think the thing is that the, the things that make the things that we like good are the same dynamics that are the things that make the things that are bad. So, where does that leave us? I mean, what are what are the what are the options? I mean, I'm I'm inclined to think that there aren't as many conspiracies, like the whole World Trade Center conspiracy. I said, if only we were that organized. <laughs> I mean, we're not. Right. We just aren't. Right? right. What's traveling is ways of thinking and and if only, if only the w and ways of doing things. If only the W administration. If only the W administration had been halfway as that competent in anything. Right, if, if only somebody was in control to that level, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Only I mean, somebody nobody knew is, what was going on. Right? That's, That's right. the, can, can you know, I, suggest, but I think power is terribly important to understand and it does, it does drive a lot. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there's also resistance to power. There's also the power that arises in the resistance. I mean, it's not, it's not like there's, I'm not arguing that these patterns, historical patterns are not, visible but i think that they they come about for the same reasons which is what we're wrestling with mm -hmm. bill did you want to jump in well it, it just is, is a <clears throat> i spent a certain amount of time trying to understand that 9 11 situation and I, i've got to tell you there's so much evidence and, and to the extent that you talk about w you know not being smart enough or whatever it really wasn't the united states that was doing it, it was the israelis they were organizing the entire thing. They, they, it basically was, I don't know if you're aware of the fact that apparently uh, Netanyahu is a very good friend of the guy Silverman, um, that's uh, the owner. In other words, nine months before 911 occurred, this guy Silverman bought the World Trade Towers for like a billion dollars, which apparently was a way considered way overpriced because there was uh, problems with um, with with um, you know the aluminum stuff. In other words, that they, they had to redo in the entire building, and, and nobody wanted the, the the buildings. And so the fact that he and, and he spent you know like six weeks negotiating just the insurance claim, just the insurance, and ended up structuring it in such a way that he got double paid for the value of the buildings because there were two events. You know, this was well thought out. The building was shut down for like two weeks to do, quote, electrical um, work and everything, during which time they actually have films of, of, of Israeli, quote, students that were in there with material that was basically used for the thermite cutting of the, the material. So that, you know, as it was falling and basically would fall free fall. Statistically, it's impossible impossible for those buildings to fall free fall without the the structural aspect being cut out and, and um, the fact that for weeks afterwards there was molten you know uh, metal down below which is impossible to heat to that level with airline fuel you know so there is so much evidence and if you watch some of the pictures there's one picture in particular when the, the building is falling that you'll notice that basically you can see the steel infrastructure standing up and then all of a sudden poof it turns into dust 
In other words, there were things that were going on. And in, 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 from what I've studied, and there's a whole book on this, a woman who basically is into understanding this, this dynamic of how you can, you can pulverize steel from afar. In other words, basically the, the US government is in, has this technology and basically dissolve those buildings. If you so look Bill, at some of the pictures of the collateral buildings- That doesn't today, argue against my point at all. In fact, it's sort of- Yeah. No, they, they're, they're, they knew exactly what they were doing, but it was not the U.S. government that was, that was directing. It was the Israelis. Oh, all right. They, they know for sure mm -hmm. how, to, how to handle these things in a secretive way. Well, uh, let me revise my, my, my point to say that I think the, uh, that the, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we would wish that the government was that organized and, you know, they may have been organized, but it didn't take a lot of people. If that's true, suppose it is, then it wouldn't have taken a lot of people. Uh, it would have taken um, small communities of people who had very special talents, who all the rest of it, that, that could be uh, marshaled and brought right. into play. That, those dynamics happen right. all the that's time. All the and sometimes, awesome. sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And... <laughs> So I'd like to put a hold on. But it's on not the, a huge. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to put a hold on the 9/11 conversation and yeah, exactly. take that elsewhere for a moment. But I'd if like. If anybody men mentions uh, chemtrails, I'm going to scream. Okay, <laughs> I, I might actually say the word just to hear you scream, <laughs> Jimmy. But, but no, I'm going to hold back. Is um, it, Jerry, is it okay? If, I'll be curious, Bill, how how you test these theories your, yourself, right? Because a lot of respect for your ideas, a lot of respect for the stuff that you bring to this group. This topic I don't have, I don't really buy. So I'd be really curious kind of how you're, what are you testing it against? How are you, how can you be so convinced, I guess, is kind of what I'm wondering. I, I just been, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm merely <clears throat> watching that as an example. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the fact that two years before uh, George W. Bush got in, into power, they wrote a, a peace. In other words, basically he and the neoliberals got together and had this, this articulation of how without Russia around we should organize the world for our own benefit and start taking charge. And they said that what we're lacking so far is a, a dynamic event like Pearl Harbor in order to accomplish that. And well, so I've always wanted to get invited to the neoliberal meetings and I don't know why I'm talking <laughs> this. And this is in this is in writing two years before. So I mean, they've 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 outlined exactly what they're doing, and that's exactly what they had to do within the the Defense Department. Basically, Cheney eradicated the CIA's support and everything in terms of the war in in, in Middle East, and and built a completely new system of of investigation and everything in the de Defense Department in order to overcome the limits of the CIA. In other words, the CIA wasn't cooperating. But let, let me shift for a second, because I, I totally agree with you that this is sort of irrelevant in the sense that, that to me, I'm trying to find out where in things like the Dow, you find the way to build trust. In other words, what, if, you, if you think systemically, <clears throat> one of, one of the, the interesting books that I read, Mark Blythe wrote a book called The Great Transformations. And his whole point in there was that if you look at the cultural aspects, of how decision making is done in such a way that you create institutions that test how you're going to deal with things that are inherently complex systems. In other words, basically Mark Blythe, but primarily being an economist, is dealing with the nature of complex economic systems. And so his whole point there was that when you look at the cultural background of like Norway and Sweden, et cetera, as opposed to the United States, where we have more of a corporate control over the situation, you get a different language that's basically saying, okay, if we're going to organize the system, what institutions do we need to do to test our perception of what works? That was the whole concept of the New Deal. That was the whole concept of the Federal Reserve System. In other words, you, you set up a system that in some way reflects what you think the complex solution is, and then you embed that in the institution and require that it stay fixated on that. Which okay. nicely goes full circle to our topic. I mean, this, this really, um, you've just gone right back into the middle of our, the heart of our topic, I think, because the, the, you know, the neoliberal agenda that, that started this conversation that was in the invite 
is a series of ways of seeing the world, <coughs> which then led to a bunch of people having license to design institutions that took over our lives, that affected a whole bunch of people who are now fighting back in the streets. Let me just give you the historical timeline along that. So you see how well thought out that process that you just described was occurring. Basically, at the end of World War II, they, they set up a Mount Pelion Society. In other words, it was basically Hayek and Milton Friedman and others that basically sort of decided that <clears throat> there's no way that in this environment with the New Deal, et cetera, that we're going to stop the Keynesian economics from, from, from doing what it's doing. But we know, quote and unquote, that it's wrong. We need to break down the systems, et cetera, in such a way that we have more control over it. And so they set up this, this organization that in essence started populating what we now have is all these think tanks, you know, primarily funded by the Koch brothers and people like that, where we've got literally thousands, thousands of PhDs that are you know, churning out papers saying this is right, which is bullshit. There's a book called Fed Up. It was written by a, a journalist who was associated with the, the Fed in Texas, the Dallas Fed, who basically called them out for the fact that they, they would not do a report, an analysis that didn't have three years of tested data. Can I how do you that? do that in the middle of a, of a crisis? As a resident, so, as economist in the room, can I speak to this stuff in a minute? Okay, yeah, but, but, but what I'm trying to get at is that the Mount Pelerin Society knew that they had to invest in creating a network in other words, an alternative set of institutions that when Keynesian didn't work and stagflation basically couldn't be explained by, 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 by Keynesian economics and everything. So they immediately rushed in and said, oh, neoliberalism is the answer. And obviously they got control at that point and started making all the changes so that at the, at the end of the day, they got the, the ability, which is a point of Chile, et cetera, to test their theory of neoliberalism being the correct way to design <clears throat> economies so that they benefit at least those who want to be benefited. Okay. So that process, and now obviously what's happening is that, that neoliberalism can't, can't solve the problem because they really don't understand the system either. If you start you know, looking at Stephen Keene's work in economics, there's a huge impact of private debt, which the neoliberals don't acknowledge at all. I, I am. All right, let's go, because actually, um, you're going to find out I'm not a, as much disagreement as you may think I am. But after this, I want Jamey to speak to the conspiracy of culture. So first, first of all, <laughs> I think it is uh, first of all, uh, all the studies and philosophy I'm doing as all is keenly attacking economics, which you know I studied. And the one thing that Plato and Aristotle would say was all this idea that you can split up knowledge into these individual molecules that aren't related has really poisoned, uh, poisoned our knowledge. It split it up. And economics is fundamentally about what are we going to do with our resources? That, and that, by the way, is an ethical question. So I don't think it's just about <laughs> Oh, no, hold on. Economics is much bigger in China. Let me finish my point. So, yes, when PhDs, when theories are coming out by Hayek and others, they have political, ethical ends. And yes, they have steered us into a very bad place because they are, in essence, political. And yes, all those professors and think tanks are, in essence, political. And they are politicking to have resources shunted to what they think ethically is the right place. And yes, we have really reached a bad end right now, and it's not working. So absolutely agree with that. You so, mean it's not working for us, it's working for the 1%. Yeah. And so Hayek and all the things you wanna say about that, I don't, I'm, I don't think a grand <laughs> conspiracy in dark rooms happened, the conspiracy was influence, which is what right. happens in society. Yeah, we don't have to call that conspiracy. It's just a collective action to, in order to get their way. And I, I thought I saw Susan reacting pretty heavily here. Susan, do you want to step in? Okay. You're muted. <coughs> you're still muted. Susan, your mic. Yeah. Hey, Mike. There we go. Try again. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, is it a matter of scale on which these things, uh, these things work? And so, um, I mean, I was l looking at <laughs> at your uh, brain there, 
and I'm looking at I'm looking at a beautiful picture of lots and lots of different groupings of people and groupings of different ideas and all the rest of that stuff. <clears throat> it's not that the scale that, uh, of 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 what it takes is 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 generated by a lot of that kind of thing. Not you know it's generated in families and friends and 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 ways of ways of doing things i don't think it has to be in order to have a big effect it doesn't have to be at a large scale it doesn't have to be deliberate that's what i want to say i'm not sure what you just said susan because in order to have to, to have a large effect it kind of has to have a large scale i think the word scale is very freighted here so i'm not i want to yeah yeah let's take that out for a minute um, yeah I, I think the place to look for answers, uh, ways in which to um, uh, do these things is at the scale at which they take place and are formed, where ideas are formed and all the rest of it. And, and, and basically... In mortar? Huh? Just kidding. What'd in you say? Mor in mortar. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it doesn't... Yeah. You don't need a conspiracy to have large scale effect. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think a big piece of our conversation is about how do things cascade across society? Like how do people, how do, how do large numbers of people change their minds or agree to some new program? I think that's a very big piece of our, of our conversations here. Uh, well, and we do, we do a lot of it right in this group, right? When somebody brings a new idea in and we, we hash it over and we turn it upside down and inside out and all the rest of us and we make, you know, make judgments and some of us change our minds and some of us don't. And um, that's happening all over the world all the time. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I want to provide a short insight into economics I had recently when I was studying Egypt again for some damn reason. And I realized watching this that <clears throat> Egypt was a fantastically successful society. Um, it was definitely the place you wanted to live at the time. <laughs> um, and so they had, you know, a tremendous amount of surplus, a tremendous amount of resources to get sitting there on the Nile. And it was really well organized. And the pharaoh essentially, you know, a hydraulic despotism, and which was all about, you know, making sure the crops got watered and the granaries of the pharaoh and yada, yada, yada. Really nice, sweet system, okay? Great job, pharaoh. And, but what did they do with their excess resources? They built cities for the dead, and that's fine. It worked and employed lots of people. You know, literally economics is that, just that or zats. It's whatever you decide is important. If you got the, re do it. And if everybody cooperates with it, then, and it works for enough people in the society. I mean, look at these cities outside the cities of the dead where all the workmen and everything work. So that's what I'm trying to point out about resources and economics is, it's a fundamental ethical decision, a, a societal decision about what do we care about? Oh, we care about building cities for the dead? Let's go do it. We, we care about building the biggest military in the world? Let's go do it. That's so I just want to provide that insight about economics. There's no, it really is that or zats. Okay, done. Like we could be on Mars right now if we really cared about doing it, but we don't, so we haven't done it. So where are we? Anyone want to orient us? Let, let, let me just <clears throat> go back to the question of trust, because mm -hmm. in, in essence, the the I'm, I'm transfixed by the fact that when you listen to true sort of Taoist perspective on how humanity works, in other words, what's the true nature of humanity and how consciousness is evolving, et cetera, it, it makes sense that if you're going <coughs> to do something wrong, in other words, rely on institutions to tell you what to do <coughs> because you can't figure it out, <coughs> then it makes sense that if you start trying to work from trust, that you have a different experience of the world. Now, let's just assume that doom and gloom is real. In other words, that, that we do have a relatively cataclysmic 
<clears throat> problem with the world with global climate change and this, that, and the other thing. There's a substantial loss of human life, et cetera, et cetera. But, but you, you get the, these smaller groups, tribes even necessarily, you know, 100,000 people or maybe just 150 people that do trust each other and know that they're coming from trust. In other words, know that, they're, that, that that's what makes things work well. And you have an experience of that. Then all of a sudden that starts to ripple, sort of the, the language of what we were saying, culture you know, ripples throughout and <clears throat> sort of creates a category. But so far the category has been to defend yourself through a system, whether it's neoliberalism or Keynesian or fill in the blank, that at some point doesn't work because it's not necessarily working for the group that wants it to work. You know, in other words, I don't know whether you're familiar with the, the percentages of our economy that, that the banking industry controls. It used to be back in the 40s, somewhere in the neighborhood of 5%. It's now 20%, 18 to 20%. And that happened, that was actually predicted by an economist in 1945, saying that we've created a political system that supports unions and ultimately it's going to be a conflict of interest, a market share issue between capitalists and, and labor, and they're going to decimate the, uh, the political nature and the political support for unions in order to do that, which is precisely what happened. He almost predicted it to a year from the point you would say it was going to take about somewhere around 20, 25 years, which is when Margaret Thatcher and Reagan came in and did exactly that. And now we've gone from 5% to 18, 20% of, in essence, worthless part of the economy because that's your, your you know, what, what's the word they use for it? In other words, the people, the, 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 the rentiers. In other the, words, they're not the doing The financialization of the economy. Mm -hmm. right. they, okay. They're that's, just that's basically everything. taking it over for their benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also just a bunch of imaginary, funny, funny bullshit. But yeah, the financialization of the economy, that's completely happened. It's completely, you know. <laughs> And, yeah. Those amounts of money swamp the real economy. Yeah, and it, and and the ability for the for, for banks to actually create money and build. Yeah, right. yeah that's all true. Mm -hmm. But so, one thing I disagree with you, Bill, is that what is this? Are you positing that institutions need to be extinguished? I think no, 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 no. <clears throat> no, but Bob, remember the point of oh, the great oh, transformations. Oh. The point of the great transformations was that we need to understand that we're living in a complex environment. Oh yeah, and that therefore you need to test your systems, your systemic responses in institutions that somehow articulate and 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 actually do what you think is the solution. You don't know at the time you're setting up the New Deal or whatever that it's really going to work. And obviously, there was a lot of debate about that <clears throat> as to whether or not it was going to work. But at the end of the day, they had to test it somehow. And so I'm not saying that institutions are good or bad. It's just that they have their time. Yes, and they work for a period of time, and then they don't. Yep, and the new deal totally worked. Yep, and uh, and and Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> we overturned that stuff, and right. we've now been living in you know shareholder value land for a, little, right. a couple of decades, and it's not working out so great. And we need to renegotiate the social contract. Jerry and I are talking about this all the time. Jerry, right. why aren't you coming in about trust and everything, my friend? By the way, the ex-urban city for the dead, Jamey, rock on. That's hilarious. <laughs> of course, I would say the, the suburbs that you're talking about are already the, the city of the ex dead. Ex-urban sprawl of the dead. <laughs> okay. Sprawl of the dead sounds like the next movie somebody has to make. Seriously. Suburbia, colon, sprawl of the dead. <clears throat> Ex-urbia, ex sorry. Sprawl of the dead. Um, I, I, I want to scroll back to like 800 different spots in this call, but I'm just going to pick one. And, and Bill, I love what you say about trust and how we have to keep going back to the well of trust and keep, you know, routing people back to trust to fix institutions and to get things done. And then holding that up against your belief in that 9-11 was, was an Israeli job is like, wow, you're, you're believing, you, you have a high, a high emphasis on trust and, uh, Sorry, Jimmy. Thanks. Um, you have a high emphasis on trust, and yet you're um, you're believing in some you know, like really um, trust breaking kind of of, of feces. So how, how does that all fit? It's 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 what I would call the systemic understanding. 
In other words, if the institutions, in other words, go back to Ra's concept, you know, human design, that, that our institutions are to manage killer monkeys, okay? In other words, the killer monkeys want to be in control. And so in that context, in order to evolve consciously, and I'm talking about true conscious evolution, you have to come from that which is now not the power orientation, not the control orientation, not the 1% orientation, not to demonize it. In other words, in this, this Tao thing, that, you know, they're very clear about, do not make wrong that which got us where we are. You always, in the Tao, you always start with where you are as perfect. But at the end of the day, you need to shift. In other words, the, the, whether it's the 9-11 or, you know, whatever happens in any other kind of, of, you know, Chile and Allende and all that kind of stuff, that just merely shows you that the one percent are doing their job. They're basically the termites or the, or the, the process that is, that is creating what they want. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that they're articulate about that and very effective about that and very focused on that, excuse me, that's what you got to do. But we keep giving up our power. I mean, you heard that, that phrase a million times, probably in social context, as well as, as personal, you know, sort of the development consciousness, you, we keep giving up our power. And to the extent that you're going to rebuild that at any level, let's call it a social level, you need to deteriorate and destroy to an extent the existing institutions. Not because they're bad, but because of the fact that they were built for the wrong purpose. Which is, I think, why a lot of people voted for Donald Trump. I totally agree with you. But, but let, me, let me articulate that slightly differently, because in a way, we, we were getting close to this and talking about <clears throat> the competition between like Margaret Thatcher and Reagan, Dominic's and, and, and the economics. And so in essence, part of the why nations fail is because you basically get different competing elites that think that they've got the right answer, which is part of the Taoist thing. Whenever you get an anarchist coming in and saying, I've got a better answer, the, the answer is no, you know, because you've just got a different agenda, you know, and in that context, agendas don't work. <clears throat> they, they basically set up a new level of competition. But the whole <clears throat> articulation, the whole fight between elites is between the elites that are basically controlling from the left as opposed to the right. And we know enough about you know, Hillary Clinton and whether it's Joseph Biden or anybody else that they're as much controlled by the system and the 1% as, as the Republicans are. So it's not like the institutions are somehow, some of them are right and some of them are wrong. They're, they're all inherently captured. And once they're captured, they're not flexible enough. They're not intended to be flexible enough in order to respond to the, the, the everyday person, their needs, et cetera. And so in that context, assume for a second, just make it easy that trust is the, the true glue that will build a respectful, healthy society. That literally could take five or 600 years to do. Or it could take two weeks. I mean, these things move quickly sometimes. <clears throat> well, but the problem is you've got, to, you've got to have some means, and the internet is one of those means, by which to get people to organize. Because, right. again, going back to giving up your power, <clears throat> we have an election. People elect, you know, whoever, Trump or, or you know, whoever. And, and at the end of the day, they step back and stop working. They stop doing anything. I've heard, I've heard criticisms over the last couple of weeks that, you know, these Bernie Sanders people are horrible because they stick around. You know, they keep working after the election. And it's like, that's a problem, you know? And, and in essence, for the political system, yes, it's a problem. They want, they want you to go back to sleep, you know, and let them do whatever they're going to do in the background. So my point is that, that whether it's 9-11 or, or any kind of Trump, you know, election, et cetera, you've got the problem of elites fighting with each other over who's, who can do it. And, and the way that it's been described that I think is most accurate is that Trump basically says that, that you know, we billionaires are entitled to run the world, so we're gonna come in and decimate everything and make it work for us better. And so we don't need politicians to intercede anymore. We don't need diplomats to intercede anymore. No, we're just going to bully this into the position we want it to be in. And, and so it's so raw now that it's easier for the other side to be more 
articulate about what do we want in terms of social contract? What do we want in terms of this kind of conversation? What do we want in terms of trustworthy systems, et cetera? That conversation can't go on until if they're motivated to, to really stand up and stay up, not go to sleep every four years. <clears throat> Anybody want to jump in with where you feel we are? What is this doing yeah. with our feelings about things? Go ahead, Mark. And, and this might this might be like going a little meta on the whole thing, but uh, and actually maybe going back to the beginning of the conversation and, and Bob's <coughs> musings about Plato and Aristotle. Um, it's it's basically that, uh, um, and and this is actually part of a. It, investigation I've just started with a group of people at Y House in uh, New York City, which is, uh, it's called uh, Fully Empirical Science and Technology. And part of the idea is that, okay, so, uh, you know, modern science uh, had a fully empirical view of so-called objective reality, number one. Number two, uh, kind of 20th century, that got softened and squished a bit, especially in, in terms of the quantum realm, the realm of the very small, also the realm of the very large. Um, and, and then there's the notion of subjectivity and intersubjectivity, uh, which I think also needs to become part of a fully empirical view. Uh, I mean, obviously hardcore science uh, elides subjectivity or suspends it. It's, it says, let's pretend it doesn't make a difference and for many realms it doesn't. The kind of realms we're talking about, it obviously makes a huge difference. And so I think this is kind of a, where our fundamental thinking uh, needs to go forward. And I think we're at in the early stages of kind of a paradigm shift among, you know, hardcore scientists as well as people studying, you know, uh, phenomenology and uh, uh, you know, Buddhist philosophy and so on. And 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 that that also relates to you know the, uh, our being embedded a complex. Uh, adaptive or non-adaptive uh, system where, uh, you know, we say there's, there's a huge anthropogenic aspect to climate change, which basically means that our subjectivities make a huge difference to the real world. Maybe that's enough. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that, that flashed in my head as we were going is that, is that some of the big movements we've talked about um, whether it's neoliberalism or the Chicago School Boys or whatever else, had these kind of conversations. I think, they, I think they've gone through these sorts of things and they've ended up thinking, oh shit, wait a minute, if we do this thing over here and then all repeat it together and then put it in the schools and then this and that and the other, it, be, it can become doctrine and then look, look where that goes. Um, so so uh, this may seem like a bit of a chaotic conversation cutting into a whole bunch of different things, but I think it's, it's the means by which a lot of groups end up developing new things to sell, new, new ideas or points of view um, to sell across, across the world. And, and there's a lot of hungry buyers. There's a lot of people out there who, who um, in order to hold on to power, in, a, in order to remain mem members of their tribe, in order to what have you, um, will, will bite. Um, and there's a whole bunch of belief systems that then have tremendous effects on people at the other end of the receiving end of the institutions. So, so the idea that people, the idea that people won't do anything unless they're under the imminent threat of starvation, which is a conservative belief, um, uh, affects the design of institutions, affects our, anybody's desire to offer a safety net of any kind, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the very implicit moral and ethical judgments that the right is doing on those people. Huge, mm. gigantic, gigantic. But, but, but we take that for granted right now. I mean, the, auster the austerity movements worldwide are like, oops, our economy is not doing well. We got to cut back on all these services for all these people. And, and all those people, you know, suffer at the end of it because we've cut away all their other ways of, of, of maintaining themselves. Uh, it used to be, it used to be that car carpenters, workers in a, in a factory using wood, had the right to pick up all the pieces that fell to the ground and take them home for firewood or to make their own chair or whatever it is. They, they had, you know, they had rights to the, to the debris. Those rights got cut away along with every other right. Yeah. 
Beautifully said, Jerry. Thank you, my friend. Um, I'd be a little bit curious. I don't know if this is if it's possible to make the call, but I've been wondering about it. But that it seems to me that I can think of it. It seems like we've had at least two kind of really big economic failures, failures in economic theory that I've seen. One is this idea that that uh, minimum wages are uh, increasing minimum wage will uh, drop employment, right? Right. That, which seems to not be happening. But that was a really strongly held economic thesis, I felt. And the other has been this idea that inflation and employment are tied. And you know, somehow we've been pouring money into the economy, inflate, you know, employment's at the lowest level ever. We're still not seeing inflation. These were fun when I was growing up, right? These were the fundamental tenets of, of kind of economic policy. And they seem to be wrong, as near as I can tell. Yep. And I'd be curious kind of what I mean, I haven't heard a lot of critique of this. I'd be curious kind of in the at least in the mainstream. I'd this be is, curious if you, uh, if you have any explanation or if they're really an issue or not. But. You, you're hitting a real pet peeve of mine, Dave, which is um, what my favorite example of it is this thing called the iron law of wages. It's not called the law of wages. And there's a whole lot of laws. I keep them under laws in, in quotes because there's, you know, lots of people have coined laws, everything from Moore's <laughs> law, uh, you know, uh, Sarnoff's law, Rosenfeld's law, et cetera, et cetera. So I got a lot of laws. This one of all of them is called the Iron Law of Wages. And it comes from Andrew Carnegie. And it's basically, it says that wages tend to the, to the minimum necessary to sustain the worker. That's the law. The law says that wages will always move toward the minimum necessary to sustain the worker. And it's an iron law. I think it's called an iron law because you are meant to not actually think about it. <laughs> you are meant to never question it. Right? And so there's a really nice essay in Harper's, Is Poverty Necessary, uh, by Marilyn T Robinson, who's thinking I really, 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 really like. Um, and she quotes all the books that I'm, that I'm talking about here. I'll, I'll put a link to this in, in our chat. Um, but she's trying to figure out, hey, like we, we just have the wrong ideas going on here. We're, we're thinking about this all ass backwards in some pretty huge ways. And so I, so I like, all the rocks that we're turning over here and all the things we're contributing to the conversation because I think that these are aspects of idea failure or idea victory. I mean, in, in some sense, um, in some sense, the failure, uh, Dave, you're describing this as the failure of some big economic ideas. I would suggest that the, this is the, 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 the temporal success of some big ideas put in the world in order to benefit a few people. And, and, that, and that now they're played, they've played out and we finally managed to undermine them, like profit maximization as the sole purpose of a firm. That one is falling, right? That one is falling. But boy, has that held sway for a really long time. And if you look at Jack Welch and you know, how Fortune Magazine uh, and others uh, held him up as, a, as the, the knight and hero and shining armor of business and of society for the longest time and, and, and what his reputation is now, that's really interesting, you know, course of life. Well said, my friend. Yeah, and all these economic relationships that are changing, David, I will address that in a little a bit. Um, you know, we're, an economy is a system of human relations, and it changes. Mm -hmm. So law, like Jerry's pointing out, we really shouldn't use that term. <laughs> These are not laws. These are big assumptions, big economic and an iron law galls me so much. I mean, really, when I, when I, I was like, wait, 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 what's this, what's this iron law? And I started looking up, you know, what it was. And I was like, this is crazy, crazy stuff. Like, this is a way to eat people's brains. I, it, it, so one of my favorite books is this Polanyi's Great Transformation. And Murray Rothbard, the head of the, the Mises Society, writes a rebuttal. He writes a rebuttal to the book. And, and he writes a letter to Mises fans and everybody else. And the rebuttal is full of bile and piss. And basically the rebuttal is language to make sure you never go try to read this book because it's so heinous. Now the book is lovely and inoffensive and is not trying to do any of the things that Rothbard accuses it of doing, most of which he is actually perpetrating in his rebuttal letter. And, and, and people hold Rothbard and a bunch of other you know, libertarians up as gods and demigods. And I'm like, Jesus, these people are trying to own the intellectual space of ideas. And they're trying to make it so that we can't, you know, experiment our way to better things, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, experimental economics is a really interesting thing uh, because it says, hey, let, let's, let's actually go use some reason to try to find our way to better, uh, you know, uh, better answers. There, there's another term, uh, um, 
philanthropy, what's it called, altruistic philanthropy or something like that, but, but sort of data, data based analyses of how these things work. And, and even those get suspect because they get held up funny. And Bo just put some interesting things on. Uh... Essentially, Her Herbert Hoover made a moralistic judgment that about austerity and caused the depression after the stock market crash. Yeah. And, and if, <laughs> the thing is, most of our recessions are caused by the Federal Reserve and caused by them using rules, like David's pointed out, about employment and inflation, for example. They throw us into, you know, so blah, blah, blah. I mean, <laughs> it's real. <There> <laughs> exactly. And we are now three minutes from the end of this call. Um, and there is an inside Jerry's Brain call at the top of the hour if anybody wants to keep talking. Yeah, let's talk about that. I was really interested, man. So it's going to be a lot of fun, Jerry. Who's it's coming up? Who uh, I don't, don't know who will be on it, but, uh, you know, pass the word. Um, but, yeah, any final thoughts? Dave, you're muted. I don't know if anybody uh, is interested in playing along, but I was amused with the uh, – I'd seen Farzad uh, Mastafari had done this tweet about, you know, using the uh, framing of uh, – of uh, you know what, what adequate depth explanations were, and I was realizing I thought that was a really interesting frame in, in the context of this call. That like, how do we explain things? And I would love to see anybody have riffs on um, on uh, what 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 adequate adequate uh, uh, explanations of different phenomena might be from your perspectives, or projecting onto somebody else's perspective, perhaps. To work on. I, so is. So is this, is, is this a riff on never ascribe to evil what is uh, adequately explained by incompetence? Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's meant to be a riff on that. Yeah. Nice. And so, I don't know, it just seemed like it's actually kind of, especially in the context of this call, it's kind of, I was thinking it's like, it's kind of a helpful back and forth. Anyway, I was amused by myself, so. And what, sorry, this is not Occam's Razor. What's the what's the name of this um, of the of the principle? I don't know. Isn't it close to it's close to Occam's Razor, right? I don't. I'm yeah. trying to find the. Uh, okay, so go back and, I've just found it. I've just found it. Let me share it uh, on the Zoom as we close out here. Ba -ba -ba -ba, share and boop. So far as I calls it Hanlon's Razor. It's it's called Hanlon's Razor. Yeah. Um, and he says you have attributed conditions to villainy that simply result from stupidity. So the idea is never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Yeah, there's the tweet that got me. Yeah. Put me off on it. And so he's riffing on that. <clears throat> yeah. And and he's talking about medical care. So. Yeah. <clears throat> um, any closing thoughts? Try more trust. Try more trust. I'm all in favor of that. I, I that that's. Totally the heart of where I'm coming from these days. It's like, and, and I don't think people understand how deeply trust has been undermined and broken, often very intentionally. I don't think people understand how many movements are rediscovering trust and implementing it in really cool ways that actually work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So more of that in future calls. Right. But for now. Well, and a version of that that I'd love to talk about is, uh, uh, but, but, but like kind of who don't you trust? Like the difference between uh, 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 enem enemies and opponents. Is Interesting. I think about it. But I That's do think that there's a category of people that are not trustworthy, and that perhaps they could be restored into trust. But anyway, we, I think we have a large in our political system right now. We have a large number of people who basically need to be banished. Um, they are not trustworthy, and so what do you do in that case? Love that. So thanks, everybody. Um, see whoever wants to rejoin in uh, in a half hour. <laughs>